I'm a huge proponent of changing the narrative of what it means to be a music manager in the current world. Mm -hmm. I think it's problematic. It's very antiquated to think that you've got to work 24 seven. And if you don't, you're going to get fired. Like you need people to be operating at a high level. You need them to be mentally healthy. Um, you need Mm -hmm. them to be physically healthy. These are things that I really push to my, my team. You know, maybe you're talking to the wrong person or the right person in this instance, but Mm -hmm. I, I want to be sort of an agent of change. And I believe in the power of a team and a culture that lifts each other up, you know, around the Mm -hmm. artists and around why and how I emailed, I mean, I mailed, uh, got addresses to every FFA within like, I think 20 States and sent them Josh Abbott band. Uh, CDs before it came out, <laughs> it was it went nuts. It went crazy. Whoa! What's going on? Welcome to the New Music Business. I'm your host Ari Herstand, author of How to Make It in the New Music Business. The book, third edition, is out now in all formats: ebook, audiobook, and of course, the hardcover. Today, my guest is Bruce Kalmick. He is, well, he is the uh, CEO founder of the artist management company, Why and How. Uh, He's been in the industry uh, for 17 years or so. Um, He started uh, Ambiance Artists. Uh, He founded that uh, artist management company, which merged with Triple Eight Management in 2012. And uh, that was out of kind of Nashville, but he signed artists like Chase Rice and uh, Icelandic rock band uh, Kaleo. Um, and he also kind of grew Triple Eight into this uh, massive artist management company um, with offices in Nashville and Austin. And he also have worked on acquisitions uh, with Good Time Inc., and, uh, which brought in Judah and the Lion to Triple Eight. And he forged an alliance when he was at Triple Eight with 30 Tigers and Sony Music and launched Triple Tigers uh, record label, which, of course, has the breakout star Russell Dickerson, among others. Um, And now he is running a Why and How management company, which represents 15 artists and has a bunch of staff members. And they uh, they're based in Nashville, also a few offices uh, elsewhere. But um We talk a lot about country music on this episode and kind of where country's at and breaking country artists, uh, but all all artists. And then we also talk about kind of the the culture of management, artist management, and just kind of uh, the music industry in general and the culture of the industry. Um, You know, as someone, Bruce has, uh, you know, launched and broke a bunch of different country artists, um, not just Chase Rice, but also Whiskey Myers and Breland. Um, it, we talk a lot about, and I, I'm fascinated with with country because uh, I it's not it's not an industry or or a part of the industry I should say that I've spent a lot of time in. Uh, it's always fascinated me, and uh, it's just something that is is operated a little bit differently than kind of pop, hip hop, indie, all of that, which we talk a lot about on the show. So uh, I learned a lot, and I'd encourage you to listen to this, even if you don't. Uh, really care for country music doesn't matter I think we can all learn a lot about every side of the industry Um, and they're uh, doing things pretty interestingly over in the country realm as well and so uh, his philosophy on breaking artists and building an artist career uh, is helpful for anybody to listen to Bruce and and why and how they just did a partnership with red light management the largest management company in the world Um, and we talk about all of that we talk about uh, why he did this partnership, why artist management companies would partner or merge or absorb or get bought or all of that stuff. So the structures of that. So, uh, you know, if you're an artist manager yourself or you're just interested in kind of how the um, how the industry works a little bit on on that front, kind of on that that higher level. Uh, this is fascinating, too. And I, I asked him about the kind of the operations of how he runs his company. Um, and, uh, and, and when and why he would bring on new, new managers and, and what that looks like, um, and what it means to kind of partner with a larger, uh, company like that. It was a great conversation all around. I really enjoyed chatting with Bruce. And so I, uh, I think, um, uh, you're going to really dig this episode. 
You can find why and how at whyandhow.com. They're also on the socials on Instagram at why and how MGMT. Uh, you can find Bruce Kalmick on LinkedIn and, and elsewhere. Um, you can find all of us that make the show happen at Ari's Take on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, X, um, threads, all the stuff. You can find me at Ari Herstand on Instagram and Twitter. Um, Visit Ari'sTake.com. Get on that email list. That's where you're going to find the most relevant, up-to-date information we send out on the email list. Go to Ari'sTake.com. Sign up on the email list. We'll let you know about new episodes and and all the happenings in the new music business. Uh, But right now, if you could just pause the episode, leave us a five-star review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts or however you're listening to this. If it's YouTube, give us a thumbs up. Subscribe. Hit the subscribe button, the follow button. If you want uh, the show to pop in your feed, subscribe to it. All right. Well, let's kick into the show. Bruce, comic, welcome to the show. Thank you. Glad to be here. Thanks um, for having me. Yeah. Did I see you're in Austin these days? Is that where you're based? Yeah, I've always been uh, in Austin, but kind of live on a plane. Uh, staff's all over the place, but a big portion of them in Nashville. So back and forth. Right. I saw that. So why are you a Braves fan is what I have to start <laughs> open with. <laughs> uh that's interesting so my child my childhood i spent throughout the southeast um moved around often kind of grew up in a pretty you know low income situation let's just say that and so we lived in Mm -hmm. i think before the seventh grade i lived in like eight nine cities but a lot Mm -hmm. was through the south and and specifically in picayune mississippi it's a tiny little Mm -hmm. town i uh it's, it's it's a story if if you wanted to hear it, but I this old lady across the street was a Braves fan. I got to oh. know her, and uh, I I'm a diehard, lifelong Braves fan, and it's a part of my it's it's, it's God, and then the Braves, and then my family sometimes. So <laughs> Yeah, you gave our our Dodgers quite a beating uh, last week, so I'm I'm still feeling the the pain. Um, but uh, we do appreciate uh, Freddie Freeman every single day. So thank you for that, by the way. Yeah, you're welcome. Hey, we got we got Matt Olson, so we're all right. But yeah, you got Freddie's Olson, you got Acuna. To, uh, I still I'm still banking on uh, Mookie to beat out uh, Acuna for MVP, but but we'll see. Uh, we, no we, chance. No, <laughs> no chance. chance. All right. <laughs> We'll see. Uh, cool. Well, we're not here to talk about baseball today, even though uh, I, I uh, would could. love to. Um, I know we, we definitely could. Um, but I, I do want to talk about um, everything else that you've been working on, um, you know, namely this. Um, well, we're going to get into uh, management and why and how and, and all of that. Um, but first off, I. Um, Tell me about this uh, red light partnership um, and just what that means, because that's kind of the big news of uh, the month or so is just kind of um, that you partnered with red light management. What does that what does that mean? Um, You know, I've envied and looked up to Corin my entire career. Um, Mm -hmm. It'd be impossible not to in this business, especially in my position. Um, sure. he's probably one of the most diligent, uh, industry executives of all time. Um, yeah. so, so I've certainly like admired what he's built over the years and I met with him the first time in 2011. Um, so mm. it, it's didn't, so it took this, that much time for us to finally find a way to, uh, to work together, I guess. But, um, you know, it's, it really comes down, you know, we have a pretty significant team at Wine House, so it was not an ordinary mm. partnership, I don't think for red light. Um, sure. cause we're, you know, 20 plus person staff, but, um, but it, it, it really came down to, to what's the rest of my career look like. And I never had a mentor, you know, I really mm. built everything from the ground up essentially, you know, on my own. And then with the teammates that are now a big part of the company, why not sure. draft off of one of the greatest to ever do it, you know, while I can, <laughs> And, and then yeah. it was meeting the rest of the team. And I know so many of them already. And I, I had so many friends I'm like, well, let's just, let, let's do this for a little while and see if it, it sticks. So, cool. um, but we're, we're all super excited. 
No, it's great. And yeah, I mean, Corn Capshaw's a legend in the industry. I mean, I, I knew of him. I'm a huge Dave Matthews fan and grew up, you know, uh, just reading all the biographies. And so whenever his name would pop up, Corn, uh, of course, being Dave Matthews' uh, first and, and only manager, um, and kind of, you know, Corn started by managing Dave Matthews' band and then grew it into the largest management company in the world. Um, I don't think there is another company that has more clients uh, maybe or managers in the entire world. So it's, yeah, yeah, it's pretty, pretty incredible what he's, what he's built. Um, and so you have, I know you have uh, kind of offices in Nashville. They have offices in Nashville um, and LA and Charlottesville and New York and around the world and stuff. Um, how, I'm just curious kind of your operations and how, why, and, or I should say, um, how, why, and how—that's going to be confusing for me as as we as we go through uh, how <laughs> how your operations work. Uh, I know you guys started, or I guess you started why and how over the pandemic. I believe twenty twenty is what I saw when you kind of shifted from triple eight. Um, are you fully remote? Do you have an office? Do you guys get together? Is everyone kind of on their own? I'm just you know structurally, I'm, yeah. I'm curious how how the operations work. Yeah, no, our uh, we have an office in Nashville. Um, it's okay. actually just across the street from red light. Now we had one, um, on eighth Avenue, um, through the pandemic really, but no, there's a, there's, I think it's 14 full-time folks in Nashville. There's, um, mm. got someone in London, New York, Houston, uh, LA. I mean, there people are kind of spread out all over, but so those yeah. folks work remotely or they go into the red light offices in those cities, mm -hmm. but we have, you know, our headquarters is not. Austin, it's really Nashville, but yeah. we are we're in discussion with another affiliated red light company to to you know put a flag up here in Austin. Um, cool. And I've, I've I've owned offices here in Austin, sold them. And I'm actually building one right now. And we may just use that, but so I, cool. I, that that's that's probably coming because there's more of an industry focus on Austin now specifically with country music than there has been in, in quite some time and it might be real this time so yeah yeah uh willie nelson can only take one city so far in in a genre yeah. but <laughs> yeah. um no that's great that's cool and i mean austin is, has of course been thriving the last decade uh or more um in, in kind of all mm -hmm. facets of of business and now uh, i mean be cool of course you know uh i know it's live music capital all of that stuff um of course they host south by um it's always fun going down to austin so it'd be cool to see you know if they bring up the actual business side of mm -hmm. uh the industry uh, in austin so yeah excited to see what you kind of develop there um i want to talk a little bit about uh country music um okay. and just kind of your background in that i mean you know having such a strong footprint in nashville but also the artists on your roster and just like your history um you know we haven't talked too much about country music on this show i've had 150 episodes and country is just not a genre that i'm super familiar with um mm -hmm. i'm you know i respect and a, a fan um it's just always seen almost like music industry adjacent um and just to me let me tell you how my perception of it and then you correct me um but like you know, I have a lot of friends in Nashville. A lot of my friends tour with country artists. Um, you know, I have people who work in the industry and country as well. But it's always seems somewhat a little bit delayed to kind of pop, I, I suppose. Like sales were still slash still are a thing for a while and downloads. It's like you always kind of when I look at the macro industries, I go, wow, we have, you know, here's where the trends are going. And like, you know, hip hop is always kind of at the front of the trends. And then like, you know, pop is slowly after. And then we have like indie and then there's rock. And then it's like country's kind of at the like holding on. It's like, no, no, we love our CDs and we love our downloads. And uh, and radio, you know, radio is like continuing. It's like always like whenever I have conversations with people, it's like radio is never part of the conversation. And then I talk to someone in country. It's like, oh, radio. It's like, what? I don't even know how to flip my brain like that anymore. So um, tell me, like, I guess, why don't you lay the ground scene right now? Like, where is country music right now? And just kind of um, what is breaking artists? Where's like the emerging artists and country coming from? And is it different from like how you're seeing, you know, pop artists break or any of that? And maybe you give a history or I'll just leave it open for however you want to take that and where you want to go with that. Yeah. 
So I, I, I think I, I think my uh, sort of approach to breaking artists, artist development and country mm-hmm. Americana is somewhat unique because I've also had some real success stories globally with rock and pop records all over the right. world and and yeah. some some influence in hip hop specifically Houston. But um, so mm-hmm. I I like all genres of music. Country is something that I grew up listening to in the same. It was like Tracy Chapman. Aerosmith, Guns N' Roses, and a Bonnie Raitt record, which Bonnie Raitt would be every bit of country today. And then sure. I learned about Reba and Clay Walker and Tim McGraw, whatever, right? So, you know, like sure. m- like most folks in the South. Um, so back then it was dominated by radio, obviously, and, and Walmart. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I've lived, I've, I've been in the business for almost 17 years now. So I've lived through having massive number one, you know, type weeks with 40, 50,000 physical sales to, you know, a streaming business that has a much longer tail. Um, right. and then, th- and then through the multiple genres, but you know, country is always behind, you know, I would say mm-hmm. a decade ago, I would say country was about eight years behind, you know, the, 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 the pop and hip hop, it's getting sure. dangerously closer, you know, and currently we're four weeks into the number one song on the billboard hot 100 being, not only country, but also independent, you know, so right. two things that have never happened. With Oliver Anthony. Yeah. Uh-huh. And Zach Bryan is and Zach distrib- Bryan. Yeah. distributed by Warner, but he's, he's independent. So, oh, um, okay. yeah. And, uh, and I've experienced that too with several artists, Whiskey Myers, you know, led the charts and, you know, not the hot 100. Um, mm-hmm. but, um, but yeah, the, the country genre is always behind and it, it really, it, I actually spoke at South by, um, a few years ago with a brand guy named Paul Jankowski and I was one of his guests on his panel. Um, mm-hmm. and he wrote a book about the heartland and the heartland is, is the reason, you know, so if you really take, you know, that L the heartland mm-hmm. from Chicago all the way over to Florida, you know, mm-hmm. they're, they were still buying their first personal computers in the last few years. They were still, it, their expectation was still to purchase a CD at, at Walmart a few mm-hmm. years ago. Um, you know, so they're just, they're behind the times. They live a, probably a, a slightly simpler life than, you know, the coasts. Um, and sure. we approach marketing and promotion that way. It's like, if you can win middle America, it seeps over to West coast, East coast, always. It's a mm. proof of concept. It's a proof of concept. And, and specifically in that panel, it was talking about how brands attack middle America first, because if they can get the adoption from the consumers in that part of the world, with their CPG brand or whatever it might be, mm-hmm. um, they know that it'll then again, spread out to the coast, almost kind of viral. Right. So, hmm. um, but yeah, the, I don't know what the second part of the question was, but, but yeah. 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 No, no. And that, that's, a, I appreciate that. Um, you know, kind of, uh, education on that. And, and it's interesting, the approach of kind of starting with the heartland, uh, middle America, and then going to the coast, because I guess in the entertainment industry, uh, it usually a lot of people think of it going the other way, you start on the coast, and then it eventually, yeah. you know, uh, yeah. middle America picks up and, and, but you're right. I mean, it's, it's interesting, you know, somebody who grew up in the Midwest, um, you know, originally Wisconsin, then Minnesota for many years, and then now I live in LA. Um, it is really funny, uh, whereas like I'm in this bubble here in LA, I've been here for 13 years and, you know, even something as simple as like, uh, TikTok or Instagram or like social media of just like how influential and obsessed we are as an industry with these platforms, uh, especially like cutting edge and always staying ahead. And like, how are we like finding this? Whereas then when I talk to people back home, it's like, they're not even on any of these platforms, let alone like using it in a way that's like innovative or like finding and discovery and all of that stuff. And maybe they're just kind of, and it's just a different reality. And so I guess it makes a lot of sense that if your, um, if your audience, uh, and the, the people that you're primarily targeting, you know, the market is, um, in the heartland, as you call it, uh, then you, you, want to i guess the, the the whole marketing idea is just like go to where they are and meet them where they're at and so i guess when breaking artists and let's just talk kind of in the last like 
five years or so because things have changed so dramatically. Um, when you're looking at a country artist, I guess let's say, you know, is like how do you approach breaking country artists these days? Um, yeah. Just personally, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's always been the same for me. Like, okay, uh, it it's it's selling tickets. So, to me, that's the, okay. that that's the heartbeat of the whole the whole system, right? The organs aren't going to run sure. without the heart, right? And the heart is touring. Hmm. The con the context mm. of the career is really built around that. So, if, to me, the most valuable statement that can be made for an artist is a fan that spends the money that takes the financial risk to go to a show because some of them really do. They've spent their, all their extra money on, on concerts. I know these people, yeah. we, we market to them. So that, that act is the most powerful act. It used to be like really powerful to have someone go to Walmart or a box store and pick up a CD. That's, that was really valuable. And it, 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 it was, you know, now you can listen to music instantly. You can buy a t-shirt instantly and it can be at your door that night or the next morning, in some cases with Amazon. Yeah. Um, but you can't do that with live, you know? So if you can establish a proof of concept from a live perspective, to me, mm -hmm. the rest of it is, is easy. And that's mm -hmm. really everything that we've ever done. And whether it was ambiance artists or triple eight or why and how I've carried that with me my entire mm -hmm. career. And it's, let's sell tickets at all costs and let's be a headliner. Let's not succumb to being a support act you know, and, uh, and let's go get radio and let's go have streaming success and let's sell a bunch of records and vinyl and merch, all of that stuff. But if you don't sure. have the heart what the rest of it is going to be really difficult to, uh, establish, you know, a, sort mm -hmm. of the bloodline. Right. So it's, it's, so, it's torn. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so talk to artists, country artists or managers who are listening right now. Um, and they're just kind of getting started. They got a, a great record. Uh, you know, maybe maybe they're uh, maybe they're in Nashville. Maybe they're not. Maybe they're in you know Birmingham, wherever. Um, what do, you know? What do you? What's your recommendation? Is it just like what do you do? I guess if we're gonna get a little bit more in the weeds and specifically, like you mentioned, touring is you know the heart. I agree. That's great. They can't just book a 50 day tour around the country as a headliner. No one's going to yeah. show up. Nobody knows who they are. So break that down a little. We're talking about breaking artists right now who right. are completely unknown. What do you do? So, so I, you know, years ago, I, I just, you know, I kind of had this model where like I want you to pick your hometown or whatever you consider your hometown to be and mm -hmm. between three and five other markets. And so, okay. you know, the, the artist industry tends to look at the, the global business and I, we certainly do and, and, um, travel the world because of this industry. Um, yeah. And, and, and happy to, but I'm like, let's establish three to five markets first, but let's just, let's get to a thousand tickets in those markets. So that, so sometimes I'll go, you know, we don't need an agent for that. I'll go to, you know, because of my experience, I'll go to the promoter directly. I'm like, Hey, I've got the next thing. I think it's going to be, you know, an 18 month process, it may move a little quicker, you know, how our marketing engine is going to work. We obviously have to attack TikTok and Instagram and so on and so forth. But, but give me 18 months, and I want a heavy load of shows in the first nine to 12 months, and then a little more scarce element in the final eight to nine months, right? So I want every first of three support opportunity you have, and then I want a headline in between, I want it to be free, free, $5, $7, $10, and if you can give me 18 months in these five markets, one of them's hometown, we're going to put money behind each market. We're going to spend money instead of on, you know, out of home digital stuff that anybody can do from the computer. We're going to go chalk the sidewalks. We're going to go knock on every sorority fraternity's door. I've done this. Like I've, this is how every, every artist was sort of developed was I, I realized quickly. I'm like, we can go to FFA 4-H in high school. And we did that. And matter of fact, I, I got a letter from the president of the FFA Association of America because I, I emailed, I mean, I mailed, uh, got addresses to every FFA within like, I think 20 States and sent them Josh Abbott band, uh, CDs before it came out. <laughs> it was, it went nuts. It went crazy. And, we just, and then the fraternities and sororities, we created a, something called jab spirit. Every sorority within 10 States was involved in this competition and they got money for it. And, 
So we, it's like, I always think backwards from, you know, where do we find the artist church? Because, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and how do we get them to come back every Sunday or Friday if it's temple, right? So, well, yeah. <laughs> that's no small feat. Like, and people are bouncing around to church, churches. Well, until they find the sure. one and then their kids, kids, kids are going to go there and it becomes part of their mm. world. And to me, mm. we're always looking for that, the temple, the church for each artist. So we, we strategically pick five markets based on where they're from, what their authentic, authentic sort of interests are or whatever. And we attack them over an 18 month period. We're not turning down shows outside of that marketplace for overspending on, on really creative things like knocking on every fraternity sorority door and giveaways and sidewalk yeah. chalk. And, you know, we, we, we have a grassroots marketing, uh, department, really our whole marketing department practices this, but you know, we will call coffee shit, local independent coffee shops. And, you know, usually the assistant manager picks up the phone yeah. tell them we have a show coming to town. We offer them five tickets if they'll put handbills on the counter and none of them yeah. say no. If we, and then we, yeah. we keep their information and we, they're always getting free tickets. Well, most music <laughs> fans really love that, you know, so they're getting yeah. something they want. We don't treat them like a, fa- a fan base. We don't treat them like a fan club or super fan. We just give right. And, Sure. Um, they become a part of a community. So it really requires mm. not a whole lot of like brain power because we're talking about like early stage guerrilla marketing and we practice yeah. it every day, even on, you mm. know, our years ago, I was sitting in a marketing meeting and they're running through all the shows for, I forget which artist. And I go, this one's sold out. So let's move past that one. I was like, no, hold on. I was like, that's exactly what we wanted to achieve. Right. We wanted to sell out the show. Let's call it a thousand tickets. Yeah, sure. well, we're, what we're talking about is spending more money in these markets. I'm like, yes, you have a sold out show. Let's leave people on the street. Let's let everyone know. And we went and spent, I think we spent five grand to over market the fact that the show was sold out and it, wow. exp- and it exploded, you know, so they went straight into a 4,000 capacity venue the next time or whatever it was. Wow. Yeah. Um, because it's, you know, it's like you're, you're slightly manipulating people, you know, because you're leave people on the street. There's a lot of mind games you play with fans to some degree, sure. but that's marketing across any. It's uh, FOMO. Yeah. I mean, it's human yeah. nature too. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. I love all that. And I, I, I really appreciate that you, you broke down these specific examples of this guerrilla marketing and really, I mean, just got to the root of it. It's just like, you're really just dealing with people. You're the assistant manager at the coffee shop. It's like, what would be interesting and exciting to them? Okay, it's a give and take. It's like, we can give you free tickets. Here's this show. They're hearing from an artist manager, which like that is so elusive, doesn't mean, you know, for a coffee shop. And so it's like, but but you're going the the guerrilla style door to door. It's like you're beating the pavement and doing the sidewalk chalk like that's I think really important for everyone to remember and to just kind of step back a little bit and be like all right instead of dumping all of your marketing powers into social media uh you know and then digital advertising or whatever like think about what the objectives are like you're saying it's like we want to get we want to sell tickets and where who are the ticket buyers? Well, they are at that coffee shop or they're hanging out over there or they're literally eating in that restaurant or it's like where do they exist and like the amount of money you'd have to spend on Instagram, Facebook advertising to target somebody so specific, you might as well just pick up the phone and call the coffee shop and that's, mail them some flyers. I think that's great. Yeah. That's what we do. I I <laughs> I, st- I still fully subscribe to something people say but don't actually practice, which is one fan at a time and what we try mm-hmm. to establish is an understanding of that fan when we do find them. And yeah. if, if they are a, a super valuable fan, they're going to tell five of their friends. And if one of those yeah. friends becomes a part of that super fan group, we've just, mm-hmm. du- we've just doubled and you can, you can see where that'll go. You know, it's simple math, right? So we, yeah. we practice that. I mean, there, it's not, it's, it's really pretty commonplace it, to see, on Whiskey mm-hmm. Myers Facebook page, which has 130,000 real people that are 95% like dialed that we're giving yeah. away tickets and offering support and they're all taking care of each other. And, and that's a culture and community that we've sort of built around every artist. And mm. it's literally one fan yeah. at a time. So That's great. Um, I, I, I noticed something interesting that I want to talk about. Speaking of marketing, um, 
on the Winehow website uh, for each artist or for many of the artists, you don't just have their their traditional team listed, like a manager, a booking agent, you know, whatever. Uh, you also have a marketing rep listed, um, and and it seems it's it's clear now why uh, you know marketing is important. But um, I'm curious when you were kind of building why and how and structuring it and how it's evolved, why did you decide to invest so much in marketing, hire marketing people? Why not just lean on outside marketing agencies or labels or those that have historically traditionally uh, maintained those roles on the team? Yeah. Um, you know, we work with a lot of outside agencies and we've worked with every sure. major record label and we currently have relationships that are really strong in that world. But but my experience has been, um, you know, probably fit, let's call it 50 50 to be fair. Um, okay. So early on, I mean, really, really early on in 06, you know, 05, I started a booking agency and I had five or six agents, you know, and thinking about that now is like, who nobody starts a booking agency, you know, and why did I have five or six agents? I didn't have enough clients, <laughs> but I, I, yeah. I, I believe in the power of a team and a culture that lifts each other up, you know, around the mm -hmm. artist and around why and how the company. Um, and I, you know, I, I talked to some young people in the business and, you know, if that's who we're speaking to here, I think mm -hmm. it's really hard once you've established what you're doing, to go backwards and create sort of that, you know, that I'd call it a, you know, sort of democracy of, of, of management um, and build a team. If you've mm. achieved something, you have cash flow coming in from that. And it's hard to kind of go backwards and be like, I'm going to pull out cash to do what? Like, I can just hire this company out. Well, I, know, yeah. I started with the exact opposite mentality. I'm going to put a team around this. And, mm. and it's just a, it's, you know, I think there are two different types of entrepreneurs. There are some that have a really strong sense of economy of scale and want to build and see how we'll see where it can go. And that's, that's where my brain goes, whether it's good or bad, that's where it goes. And there's some that yeah. just have like a, a more like kind of, I want to have one client or two clients and an assistant. And that's just, that's going to mm -hmm. be my, my business. And, um, you know, uniquely red light and Corin has been able to attract both sides to, to the inner workings of red light on the management side. But it's just it's it's really based on my personal desire to scale. Cool. No, that's great, and that's helpful. And I, I think it's something to think about for a lot of management teams. Um, you know, maybe integrating uh, some marketing staff directly um, into the company and on the artist teams because marketing is so important. I mean, it's kind of. Uh, it, it's the one thing that can really move the needle when you're trying talking about achieving those objectives, like selling tickets. Uh, you need that marketing. Um, so when it comes to kind of, uh, I, I want to get back to kind of the the breaking artists. Um, mm -hmm. You do work with artists of of all different genres, and you have over the mm -hmm. years. Um, how is there a difference of approach? Um, you know, we've talked about this three to five cities. Uh, let's go for selling a thousand tickets within eighteen months, kind of a thing, and and that's kind of uh, within country music the approach there. Um, is your approach different when it comes to other genres? Maybe some of these ones that um, are more digital leaning or 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 more at the you know cusp of. Uh, where entertainment is heading and, and on that front, or I guess, or is, or is this just your philosophy kind of carte blanche with all the artists that you work with? Uh, it's probably the latter, you know, like I'm attracted okay, cool. to, to artists and artist development, uh, relationships that, that are centered around, around not, not being a, you know, 300 days a year on the road actually i feel the exact opposite sure. i want these artists to build families and be happy and you know those are things mm -hmm. that you learn over 16 years or whatever but um but no i i it's really hard for me to sign an artist that won't have a, a touring career it's just not something that i relate to you know yeah cool um 
I want to talk about the structure of why and how, um, just as a management company, I'm very curious, you know, we've had a lot of managers on the show. Uh, I've talked to a lot of managers uh, at all levels, uh, representing all different kinds of, of artists. Um, I'm very fascinated with how management companies function because, you know, just on the, I'm just going to lay the foundation um, of kind of by the book of just, you know, how artist management works for people listening. It's like, you know, typically an artist manager uh, is, you know, the, the artist's right hand. They are the ones that are kind of the buffer between the artist and the outside world with every team member, uh, formal or informal. Um, And they typically take anywhere from 15 to 20% commission of an artist's career. Now, in terms of how managers uh, work, if you're an independent manager and you're living and dying and eating and paying your bills based on just your artist roster, it can be feast or famine. It can be up and down. If your artists aren't bringing in revenue this month, now nobody eats, you know. And if their records aren't streaming or selling, you're not getting revenue from this like passive income. It can be challenging if the artist is a live artist and and they make all their money on tour and you're not touring for four months. It can be tough. I've noticed management companies can kind of help. Um, that feast and famine, that up and down in a, in a way that there might be a little bit more stability sometimes. I'm curious how you set up why and how um, and just kind of the operations of just how the company works. Yeah. Um, so I I think key and most importantly, like a, a why and how is, is why and H, why and H is my kids, Wyatt and Hazel. It's built around the concept of family first. So, you know, and that coming from other situations that I've been in my career, I saw instances that didn't feel as culturally um, sustainable. And so, you you know, that's just part of, you know, evolving as an entrepreneur. And, you know, so that was the key. It's like, this has to be about family first. And that's for everybody, for the artist, Mm -hmm. for every staff member, you know, we really, you know, I really, there's a whole nother podcast, but, you know, I really have a problem with how, you know, women specifically have been treated in the music business and, you know, the fears of having kids and all that stuff until they're successful. It's one of the things that just really, um, you know, it, it kills me. Um, so I've really pushed the agenda, like, let's have families, more people on the beach at our retreat every year, more kids mm-hmm. running around is better. So at the core of what we do, it's, it's family and then the impact we make giving back. So through our artist vehicles, their brands, you know, let's go raise money, let's give, you know, so those two things really start, start it all. Um, and then it's building a culture that is not, I don't micromanage anybody like at all. You know, I've mm. put an executive team around me that runs different elements of the company, whether it's global strategy or marketing promotion, digital touring, branding. Um, I have a VP of roster operations. Like, what does that mean? Well, She's, she's basically in my right hand and make sure that there's just every hole is being filled. And, mm-hmm. you know, we're blessed to have the, the ability to do that. Don't get me wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's not a red light thing. We came in with that. Um, sure. so it's, it's creating a culture really at the end of the day yeah. that, that, uh, that you can lean on and trust. And that's what, there's so many people like, um, sort of at the earliest stages in our company, you know, my instincts is to find somebody that's very eager that whether they have a music degree, don't have a music degree really doesn't matter to me. Do they have the passion for it? Do they really Mm -hmm. want to work on this side of the business? Because, you know, Mark Cuban calls it the most difficult business in the world to succeed in. And he owns a a NBA basketball team. Right. So if he's, and he won't invest in the music business because of that. Well, if you're going to get into this business, it's not easy. And, you know, I have a little bit of a program for the young folks to, to kind of prove it's not, it's not malicious by any means, but it's like, let's make sure that this is where you need to be. Cause I'd rather mm. you cr- cross it off your list as an intern or early stage employee of the company, rather than follow this dream for too long and not be able to fall back on. Maybe you just belong. You know, maybe you just need to be a publicist or an agent or whatever. And, and sure. so I think, you know, we try to help people figure that out early on, but so that, that, Mm -hmm. that's sort of the summary of the culture of the company. Um, but Mm -hmm. I like to 
grow people internally and they, so they understand the culture from day one. And it, it, um, you know, I feel super blessed and lucky to have people that have just stuck with me for a very long time. So, yeah, no, that's great to hear. And, and I, I do want to talk about culture a little bit, um, because, um, you know, we just, mental health gets discussed and tossed around a lot in the industry, uh, primarily because, uh, notoriously, uh, we haven't really, it hasn't been, there hasn't been mechanisms, I should say, for those in the industry to seek, um, help and the culture, because it's so fragmented across the industry, um, there is no cultural kind of community standard handbook, whatever, across the whole industry. You know, we're not Disney. We don't have, you know, sure, maybe a universal or something, but we're of the tens of thousands of other people that work in the industry, uh, specifically managers, you know, uh, it, in artist management, the culture has seemed like it's an always on position. It's like when you're dealing with, with artists, um, and creatives in general, you know, they're not working on traditional office hours. There's no weekend, you know? And so it's like, I'm curious, like, how do you set up this culture and maybe boundaries or, or frameworks, um, where you can encourage your staff, like you said, to, to think family first and to focus on, on their family and all of that. But how do you balance that with the realities of the position of being an artist manager, which is an always on position where your artists are texting you at two in the morning, freaking out about the X, Y, and Z? Like, what, 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 what do you, what do you tell your staff, and and what is the approach there with that? How do you, how do you work yeah. with that? Well, you know, um, I can't say that I've always been right about my approach, right? Even personally, okay. I'll, you know, after my son was born, I was on the road a week later and, and I'll, and I'll never forget it. And I, and I apologize to my wife many times. It, it was pressure from an artist who since apologized for that pressure. And, you know, I was in a mm-hmm. place where I like, well, I guess I, I gotta go, I gotta go for the night and come back. What a, so that I use that as a, as a, an example to my staff. I'm like, we're not, that's not what we're going to do, you know? And mm-hmm. there's a big enough team. Every artist probably has between four and seven people that touch on their business every day. Right. So, Wow. We, yeah. So when you have that sort of team in a culture that really believes in that, the artist is always sort of being served in some way. And um, mm. and we work so closely with the, the team on the road, too, that they're conduits. You know, some of them even work for Wine How, you know, tour managers and sound guys and so on and so forth. So um, I'm a huge proponent of changing the narrative of what it means to be a music manager in the current world. Mm-hmm. I think it's problematic. It's very antiquated to think that you've got to work 24 seven. And if you don't, you're going to get fired. Like I've, I, I, it really does the opposite and I've seen it directly. Mm -hmm. Like you need, you need people to be operating at a high level. You need them to be mentally healthy. Um, you need Mm -hmm. them to be physically healthy. These are things that I really push to my, my team. Mental health is something that is really near and dear to me currently. Um, and I won't speak on what it was, but it's heartbreaking mm-hmm. to me. And, um, and I've been pushing mental health and, you know, and there's an instance where I'm going to step in, I'm going to take care of it. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be there. I don't want it to be my staff's, you know, they, they have to hide it and it's a, it's a personal thing. And I'm like, no, I'll pay yeah. for it. I'll help you out. Let's go to therapy. Let's yeah. do whatever we got to do because the stronger mm-hmm. they are mentally and physically, the better they're going to be. And the, and the more successful the artist is going to be in return. So we have, Mm -hmm. so I really think of our team as like, you know, I, I look, I do these bandwidth exercises and I, and I include mental health in there for staff members. And I check in as much as I can within reason. I basically have told everybody, like, I got to get in your business from day one, if you're going to work on this team and, um, and only for the better, because I need to know if, if you need something if you need money if you need yeah hell if you need whatever you know like so so yeah i think you know maybe you're talking to the wrong person or the right person in this instance but Mm -hmm. i i want to be sort of an agent of change and and Mm. and and push that agenda it's too important and and the artists that think 
that because we don't answer at 2 a.m. that we're not doing our jobs, those aren't the artists that we want to work with anyways. Yeah. Mm. Nice. Well put. Um, yeah, we just had uh, Daniel McCartney, who's an agent at UTA, on mm -hmm. the show, um, and he he started the uh, the Continuance uh, the Continuance Foundation, which is a organization that that focuses on on mental health resources and assistance for those in the music industry. We've also had Backline, mm -hmm. uh, which is another organization uh, that focuses on mental health uh, resources um, and guidance for those in the music industry. I'm hopeful that. You know, as we have more of these conversations and we can talk more openly about uh, mental health and just the culture of how the music industry operates, that that will permeate uh, all facets of it from sure the you know, the corporate culture, but that's a whole other beast of like the labels and the majors, but more so to management and agent, you know, booking and, and PR and, and um, you know, all the non-traditional roles, uh, which are honestly kind of the majority these days of who's working in the industry. Um, so, so that's nice to hear that, you know, you're kind of um, thinking about that as well and, and uh, prioritizing that. Yeah, well, um, yeah. so um, ch ch changing gears a little bit, um, you know, I'm curious when you decide to bring on staff, uh, managers specifically, and and not necessarily in a in a an entry level position, not like you know as an assistant or an intern or straight out of college or something, but like you want to uh, bring on maybe a manager in their roster or something like that, or you're partnering. I know you've done a lot of like partnerships, merges, uh, that mm -hmm. acquisition, maybe that kind of stuff. What are you looking for in uh, managers or the roster or all of that if you're going to decide to partner with them or, or actually bring them under the kind of why and how umbrella? Yeah, I mean, again, I'll say it again, culture. You know, so we, we sit down and okay. we try to align with people that we feel like can yep. immediately walk right into our office and be a part of the community that, that we've mm -hmm. built and, and feel like a part of the family right away. And if we don't feel that way, no matter who their artists are, that they're bringing with them, one sort of rotten egg can spoil the whole carton. You know what I mean? So, um, sure. so we're very careful about that. And our, I love to collaborate partnerships are a huge part of this business. I believe that it's almost entirely partnership based. So mm. we're always trying to find the right partners and there's so many good ones. And there's some that I've encountered over the years that I, that aren't good, you know, and it's not that they're not good people or they're not good managers. They're just not good for what sure. we do um, at yeah. the end of the day. So. Nice. No, that that's, uh, it makes a lot of sense. Um, and um, so, You've done, speaking of kind of partnerships and, and that kind of stuff, um, you know, when you were uh, at Triple Eight, uh, I read somewhere that you started um, or you're kind of part of the launch of Triple Tigers, um, kind of the, the label. Um, and are you, I guess, talk to me about starting record labels or imprints or completely indie labels. Um <laughs> And the reasoning behind why you would start a record label of your own versus uh, partnering with a label and maybe kind of where we're at, I suppose, in terms of the pros and cons of working with indies versus majors versus starting doing your own thing. Yeah, well, I'll speak to Triple Tigers quickly. I mean, that that was um, that was sort of birthed out of this this long-term partnership that I had with David Macias and, and 30 tigers, um, 30 tigers. Sure. And, and there were a few instances, a couple of them being my artists that they were distributed by 30 tigers and we partnered and, you know, we did our thing and they, mm -hmm. they put the records in stores back in the early days, like I said. Um, and those mm -hmm. artists would then leave and go to majors, including the, my own artists that I managed. It's like, and David called me one day and he's like, you know what, let's just start a, a label, like a real label. I've already talked to Sony. They're going to give us, you know, X amount of dollars and let's get this thing going. And, you know, at that point brought in my partner at the time, George. And, um, and then shortly thereafter, the guy that runs it and has really been the, 
the heartbeat and the, the reason why it's worked is Norbert Nix, um, who ran one of the radio teams at Sony Nashville. And we brought him in and, mm. you know, initially he was the GM, but, you know, he was running it from day one. And, and then he brought in Kevin Herring and it just, they became a very successful commercial country label. And we facilitated mm-hmm. a home for Russell Dickerson, Scotty McCreary, you know, namely. Sure. And they've had tremendous success there. So um, mm-hmm. it's something I'm very, very proud of, but um, I'm not personally a part of it anymore. And, and uh, sure. I won't get into the details, but it, it, it was uh, incredibly fruitful. But um, but really, it's Norbert's mm-hmm. label, and um, I respected what they're doing. And when Triple Eight ended, there were some cogs that turned. Let's just say that. So. Sure, sure. Um, is that a focus or... Um, an option for th- yeah. the wine how team now is to to mm-hmm. do your own th- similar kinds of deals like that. Yeah, so I have a, I do have a distribution um, deal um, with a, a distributor. It's called Oil and Gas, um, and we put out called, some records. I'm sorry, what was that? Oil and Gas. Oil um, and Gas. Okay. Which is my which is how I've always really described streaming, like streaming even early on. I really mm-hmm. thought like, gosh, this is, this is oil and gas. This is a commodity now. It's like mm-hmm. running water. Yeah. Um, and this is before, like, I remember, you know, we were managing Sam Hunt and they did not want Spotify involved. And we brought John Marks, who was running it at the time over to UMG Nashville and put them together like Spotify has to be involved and Sam Hunt is breaking mm-hmm. because of this platform and that opened the, the floodgates for UMG Nashville it's kind of crazy that wasn't that long ago um eight mm-hmm. or nine years ago or whatever um but mm-hmm. I've always saw it as, as this com- you know this commodity what a great thing and now it's caught up to itself but so I do have that distribution element there's another one that I can't fully discuss but but it's coming but there's Yes, absolutely. It becomes a part mm-hmm. of what we do. I mean, we run Whiskey Myers, Wiggy Thump Records. We've, you know, essentially run Chase Rice's label his whole career. Um, I ran mm-hmm. Josh Abbott's. It's it, it it's that's where I come from—a place of self-starting, entrepreneurial independence. You know, and sometimes we get really lucky and have great partners at majors. So, um, yeah, you know, these I've had several JVs though, and I currently have a couple. So. Um, it's, yeah. It's, and just yeah. to clarify, JV, is that, uh, just meaning like an imprint underneath a major? Uh, no, it, it's a, or is the distributor uh, distribution it, deal. It's a joint venture between two parties, you know? So it's, sometimes there's a distribution element direct and sometimes it's coming through another entity. Um, okay. so it, sorry to speak in sort of, um, cryptics because it's not something that's announced yet. So, but but sure. no, no, it's all good. A lot I, of these. Yeah. Yeah. Well, with oil and gas or, or just any mm. uh, these kinds of deals, I mean, I think it's it's interesting that how many different styles of record labels and distributors and distribution deals and label services companies and all of that, I think, you know, uh, it's so much more fragmented than it ever was. And so I think there's a lot of confusion when it comes to just you know, who are we signing with? Who's the record label? Who owns the music? You know, I'm, I'm curious how, how, you know, transparent you can be with like with, with the Chase Rice deal or with any of the artists that you work with, like, is there ownership now or are the artists maintaining ownership? Is there a label when you do a distribution deal with like a UMG or a Sony or something like that? And it is a, you know, if it's some kind of partnership, is Sony owning the music, the masters, is it a licensing deal? I mean, I'd love to, for you to just kind of, if there is, you know, obviously you can't break down the specifics deal by deal, but I'm just curious if there's a standard, if there's like, where are we shifting as an industry? What are you seeing kind of, what is kind of becoming the industry standard in this realm? Yeah. Um, I think without question, we're shifting. Um, Mm -hmm. I think independent music, was up like 6% last year and it's projected to be up another four or 5%. You know, if it got Mm -hmm. to 50, 50, I think we'd be, you know, in a, in a really harmonious place between artists that own their own music and 
you know, the major label system, of course, the major record label system, which is in a lot of ways publicly traded now. And like, they don't, of course they don't want that. That's going to really cut them off. Um, so mm. it's a, it's a conflict, um, but it's inevitable. It's like, you know, it's like Austin. Well, there's a million people that didn't want to see Austin grow. I'm sorry. You know, you can't stop progress. Um, and it's a good thing. I think independence is, is absolutely necessary um, for a lot of mm-hmm. artists. But it's we also have such strong partnerships with labels that in some cases I'm like, OK, yes, it's it's a it's not a royalty split that I love, but they're providing so much that it, it is harmonious in that sense. But then you have instances where, you know, as a management company that has a staff of people, we operate like a label, you know, so we're providing all the services but the artist is still giving up and we do it for the same percentage, you know, like there's a manager that you could compare us to that has no staff and does it by himself. And he's making the exact same percentage we are. We're okay with that. You know, and that's the unique thing about management, but, um, but we, I, but you're not owning any of your artists masters, are you? No, well, in, in certain cases, but they're all, necessity so if it's a it's a, if it's an early stage i'll be like hey i've got to cut a, a master's deal with you and it's going to be whatever it is but i'm going to let you earn it back out and and if a late uh, if another opportunity comes along i'm going to you can buy out what i've spent and plus a percentage and we'll move on it's just if a, you know artists have no money like i have to i have to put some element of risk into this sometimes it's hundreds of thousands of dollars you know so but I, mm-hmm. I, I don't know. I don't, I don't, uh, I'm not signing artists that I can own their masters or anything like that. That is a part of the management world, but that's not really part of how I see it. Um, well, that's, I mean, that's really interesting. It, it's so you, there are some instances where you have invested in artists. I mean, do you approach that like a, a you, you mentioned they could buy it out or a traditional investment um you know labels uh historically of course invest in artists they would call it and you know give them hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars in an advance plus x amount in marketing etc but in exchange historically for full ownership of all their masters in perpetuity you know while keeping the lion's share of uh the the royalties the master royalties now that's shifting and we're seeing more 50 50 licensing deals even at the major label level um but i'm curious if there is a model that you have become comfortable with i guess operating within um you know your deals uh that you're seeing that maybe isn't so cut and dry with how traditional management has functioned or traditional labels have functioned? It's, it's hard. Like I don't have a blanket response to that because with every client, there's a different set of circumstances that really will spit out like a, okay, here's our, here's our options. Um, sure. But in a, in a perfect world, I want the artists to own their music. You know, I like the idea of music being leased out to distributors or labels for, three, four, five, six, even seven years or whatever, so that they have a long enough tail to recoup. Um, and there to be a royalty um, conversation that can start at 70, 30 in the label's favor, but that can get, that can earn their way into a 50, 50 royalty split after, after money is recouped and certain benchmarks are made. I think that's the middle ground that the industry is probably going to get. They're already there because I've cut some of these deals already, but, um, but if I think that's the middle ground that can keep both sides really happy. Um, mm. But there's also still like, like I said, these are, these are major institutions that are traded around the world. You know, they're, they're, they're answering to a, a, a different set of circumstances, a board of directors and a global economy, you know, so that, yeah. that, that's not really that great for, little brand new artists and signs to X, uh, label in my opinion. So we try to, we try to yeah. carve those things out. Right on. Well, cool. Um, well, Bruce, this has been, uh, super informative and, and I know everyone listening has really appreciated, uh, kind of your transparency and candor and, 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 I think above all, uh, the, the kind of the culture that you've established in building and the priorities that you've laid out, um, I guess, uh, over your whole career, um, including now why and how and what you're going to take as kind of this partnership uh, with Red Light. 
Um, I have one final question that I ask everyone who comes on the show, and that is, what does it mean to you to make it in the new music business? Yeah. Um, I think the, the ultimate success is watching an artist grow to a place where they can sell tickets and have people, whether it's 300, 500,000, 10,000 people seeing their lyrics back to them, you know, and standing on stage as a manager, there's no better feeling than that. Um, but I will say like the, the older I've gotten and, and the more that I've become a father and a coach and so on and so forth for my own kids, marrying those two things, you know, that moment on stage, you know, if you're an artist, that's what you're, that's what you want, as you know, and there's mm-hmm. nothing better than that, but except for playing with your playing catch with your son or holding your daughter or playing catch with your daughter or whatever, you know what I mean? Like, though, so if you can marry those two things, you, you want at what level, it doesn't really matter to me as a manager. I see that from an artist or from my staff. It's like, well, we did it. We figured it out. So <laughs> Bruce, thank you so much. That was great. Yeah. Today's episode was edited by Mikey Evans with music by Brassroots District and produced by all the great people at Ari's Take.